Welcome everybody to the Vermont Vegetable and Berry Growers and UVM Extension webinar, which today is just an informal Q&A and comment section. Growers are welcome to contribute just ideas, not just questions and answers as well. We got a, a powerhouse of brain power on the line here. I'm glad Ann could make it too. So we've got pest expertise, engineering expertise, post-harvest, nutrient management, and more. And we can see how it goes if people just pipe up and ask questions or some, you can put something in the chat as well if other people are talking and then kind of would have things in the queue. But I'll just open it up to someone who wants to start with a, a question or an observation for discussion. Yeah, and I'll just add, Vern, um, if any anybody, um, farmer or um, service provider wants to share their screen to share pictures just ask me um and i can it's really easy to allow people to share the screen but it has to go kind of through me or i guess you Vern. and i can monitor the chat if people would rather type in questions great who wants to be the first to go i know ann had something she wanted to share about what's going on with squash foliage this time of year oh. Yeah, I did. Uh, we had a case of downy mildew in cucurbits down near Brattleboro. That's confirmed, so I wouldn't be surprised. It was in cucumber, um, and uh, I mistakenly put up cucumber and watermelon on the site, which was not correct, uh, but it's just on cucumber. So if everybody's seeing any like sort of angular looking leaf spots, foliage going downhill really fast, uh, look on the un leaf undersides and it's probably downy mildew. This disease blows in on storm fronts and can kind of wipe out your last planting of uh, cucumbers if they're not resistant. So that's the thing, either look for resistant cultivars or um, when downy mildew is close by, that's when you really have to have a protectant fungicide on. And I think the organic ones are, what I read, it said suppressive at best. But if you're a conventional grower, there's a, a lot of options that you can use as a protectant fungicide. Thanks for that, Ann. Yeah. Any questions from the peanut gallery? Anybody else seeing any uh, downy mildew in other parts of the state on their cucumbers? Uh, this is Linda, the same part. I'm in Westminster West, and yes, I've it's wiped out my not my latest cropping yet, but my 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 first one, it's wiped it out. Yeah, I've had it. Well, I'm surprised it would only are they different cultivars? No, they're the same. I um, th I don't think Are they've just sure? gotten to it yet. I I some, oh I I don't they I don't think they've gotten to it yet. I've been spraying um, fish stuff and um, uh, EM one, and that helped and, it a little bit. Maybe I should just cover that, it up uh, now if it's not bad. Are you talking about powdery mildew? Do you think is it more of a white coating on the leaves? That you're seeing no it's brown spots it's brown spots that's downy yeah. mildew right well it can be downy mildew it can be a lot of things that cause brown spots so i doubt you know once downy yeah. mildew grows oh, okay. into a, an area or a field it pretty much wipes out all the you know it wouldn't just hit the first planting um, so you may have okay. another disease you probably have another fungal leaf spot disease in there you could have uh, gummy stem blight or anthracnose, something else. So yeah, and it's oh, probably, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah then, okay. then the first planting would look worse. The later ones would probably look better. But it, once you get downy mildew, it would wipe out all the susceptible ones. Okay, thank you. Yeah. This is, whose pretty field was that with the caterpillars? or low tunnels. That's um that's Kathy Wells at Unity Farm in Charlotte. I don't think wow. she's sharing a beautiful picture of her farm. Yeah, it's pretty. Um 
I'm sharing a pepper plant here. Can you see that? Broad mm -hmm. mite. Yeah. Broad, yeah. So that's what I was going to ask. It sort of looks a little virusy, maybe leaf hopper, but I think. Uh, no, it's broad, broad mite. mite. Yeah, because that uh, anytime you see that scarring up along the top, that's really um, okay. diagnostic for broad mite. Mm -hmm. And it causes that curling and twisting, sort of like a, uh, an herbicide or a virus. And so basically yank them and dispose of them since it's not widespread in the field, just a small area would be your... Yeah, situation. probably. There's no probably rescuing it at that point in the... I mean, they could try, are they organic? They could try neem, but it's pretty hard to rescue once you've got a good solid infect, infestation there. So probably pull out these plants that are symptomatic and maybe try neem on the neighboring plants. Yeah, yeah. And they like peppers the most, I think, but they also will go to um, a lot of the tomatoes, eggplants. So right. if they if they don't see any symptoms on tomatoes and eggplants, they might want to rip out the peppers and keep those protected. I don't think she's going to rip out all the peppers because they mostly look good. But I'll okay, pass it on. yeah, thanks. Yeah, and it doesn't over. It's not supposed to overwinter here, so they may have brought it in on transplants or uh, oftentimes it's on ornamentals that they bring in. So just you know, watch for that when you buy buy in ornamentals from southern areas. Okay. Any questions from the crowd? I can keep pulling up scary images. <laughs> That's good. <I'll> do that. <laughs> it's a well, stump the I have a question about um the um uh peppers and eggplants that are it seems like in many growers cases are making a lot of leaf and not much flower. I've heard from a couple people that way in the area. Um, and what do you do? Because I was, I understood that if you give them a lot of nitrogen, they're going to make a lot of leaf and no flower. But for some reason this year, uh, small gardeners and farmers are seeing that. And then what do you do now? Should I fertilize them now to help them? They're starting to flower right now. What should I do? Um, Linda, this is Becky, and I think you've probably been following on the listserv that a lot of people have had that problem. And yeah. um, I think there's a combination of things going on, and um, Bern or Ann could probably add to this, but I think over the High temperatures, especially sustained nighttime temperatures, the blossoms will either abort and drop off or there's a lot of botrytis in the blossoms. And I also think the pollen gets sticky and you don't get like the right kind of fruit set. So mm -hmm. the heat, I think, has been a big problem. Um, I think at this point, if you have flowers, I wouldn't fertilize. I, if the plants have had plenty of foliage, I think it's late enough in the season that you could hope for the best, but I doubt you'd get much fruit, you know, given that it's September. Yeah. Um, you could try stripping a little bit of lower foliage just to force a little energy, but um, I, you know, how many days is it now but between now and frost, especially if it's in the field? Yeah. yeah. Cross okay. your fingers for one ball or toss some remay on them once they start kind of fruiting and it cools down. But I think it's been a tough year for some of those crops. Okay. So yeah, just a nasty tunnel tomato situation. There's some of that physiological leaf curl, which you get calls about every year. It seems to be varietal with some unclear environmental interaction where the leaves just fold up on themselves. But then there's a lot of other nasty things going on there. What do you make of it, Ann? I don't I don't know. Uh, yeah, it just looks kind of I I just I don't see anything that's points specifically to a disease, an infectious disease, but I'd sure want to know if you know what the lower plant looks like if it's getting plenty of irrigation and 
uh, looks really crowded. So whatever is dying in there would be prone to botrytis if they've got high humidity. You know, it looks just more like scorch, like leaf edge dieback to me, which could be a, you know, a root issue, could be a lower stem issue, could be irrigation, and it could be a wilt disease like, you know, bacterial wilt, but I don't know. Did you see them close up or is it just a picture? Uh, it's just a picture and yeah. you and I, Becky, others get lots of photos like this over the years. And yeah, I think one of the challenges is one thing leads to another. So once you have dead tissue, then there'll be detritus and other things in there. There's probably always a little bit of, you know, if there's water splashing on the leaves, it could be some early blight, but um, it is interesting when you see tissue that's dead and no, no signs of sporulation up close. Probably something environmental, but um, this is why we always like you to have send samples up to Ann to take a real close look and see what's going yeah, on. Yeah, but when I see when I see pictures like that and I see like dead areas with no sporulation, you know, I always look lower in the plant. And if you can sacrifice one plant you know, cut into the lower stem, see if you see browning in the vascular or the water conducting system of the plant. Take a look at the root systems and look at your irrigation, um, especially if you're noticing it throughout the whole house, then it's probably something more abiotic, uh, non-infectious, more like irrigation or could be burn from fertilizer, I guess, or salts or I don't know, but if uh, if it's hit or miss, then it's often a more of an infectious problem. But throughout the whole house, it's often more abiotic. I've seen a ton of um, botrytis this year too that some growers have thought are you know bacterial problems, and I just think the weather kind of made botrytis take off. And so a lot of the dead tissue, I think, in that picture could have been a previous botrytis infection that just turned yeah. Into yeah. yeah. So I have a question for Vern and Becky, I guess. Um, like how common is it, would you ever shade high tunnels? Like during hot, crazy summers, like will we, I remember at the UVM greenhouse, they used to spray a, you know, like a paint or something to cut down on sun. Oh Would yeah, ever sure. Definitely, uh, especially, you know, in the heat of summer and it's really hot, yeah. there's more light than the plants can use. Um, I would yeah. not use, uh, um, I would not use paint because, you know, we, there are shade materials, sprays that are formulated to not interact with a plastic. So paints okay. can actually promote the deterioration of the um, bitonal plastic. So. Not ideal. Yeah, I think that was on a glass house. That UVM is glass house, but yeah, I mean, so yeah, Griffin sells a product, um, and then there are cloths too. People put shade cloths up, which just you know the the shade materials that you spray on are sort of meant to wash off at some right. regular rate, so that by after winter they're not there next year. Paints are probably going to vary in how well they're removed. And I know Howie Prusak put something on the list serve about material he's been using with success. I think he gets it from Griffin. I could dig that up for people. They're interested. Yeah, that's called Cool Ray. But, um, yeah, I'd open it up to the crowd here of anybody using shading on their tunnels. Certainly on when they're small tunnels, I'd heat up a lot. I mean, the bigger ones with a lot of volume and good ventilation, not as necessary. But if you're getting over 90 degrees where you have tomato flowers, for example, that is not good for fruit set, so shading would be good. Anybody using uh, shading? Yeah, I wonder if that's just going to become more of a common practice. You know, when we have, I mean, this was the hottest summer on record. And you know what? Next summer will probably be hotter, but I don't know. Invest in spray materials. Put your money on its record in. Vermont or where was that? Was yeah, in Vermont, I think. They had to wait till September 1st to officially, you know, close out the summer. But once they had September 1st data, I think 
Yeah, it's official. Yeah, I think so. This is Scott. I think um, four of the last five summers, right, have been the hottest summer on record. So the trend is moving in that direction. So I, I have a couple of thoughts about shade cloth. Um, one is that um, there's a grower that I work with who moved up here from down south. He had 50% shade cloth on all of last year and it, the plants were super leggy. This was tomato plants and um, very vegetative. So I think if people are going to choose a shade cloth, like 30% is more recommended for our climate. The other thing is um, that paint that Howie Prusik uses is called Cool Ray and you can get it from Griffin. Um, I actually I did recommend it to a grower this year and um, they were if you read the label it's a little concerning so I just I would caution folks there it's um, got titanium dioxide in as the active ingredient which does wear off and it's like what's in a lot of natural sunscreens but I guess in a spray form it can potentially be carcinogenic used over time so just um, before you jump in and buy it I would read the label and assess your risk I was a little um, hesitant to bring it to VOF's attention to see if it's actually approved or not, because theoretically it could come into contact with the soil, but um, I wasn't gonna really worry too much about that one, but just a couple of thoughts there. Good, thanks for sharing. I just showed a picture of small tunnels with um, had aluminum type shade cloth on it. Let's see, I'm going to share this one. And that's a black cloth. That looks like pretty thick, pretty intense shading as well. You can see how um, it's attached on there. Vern or anyone else, do you guys know about the cooling walls? Like, to, what's it, cardboard material? Oh, that that um does evaporative cooling. I think so. I mean, we used to have those in the university greenhouse, so they're ripply layers of cardboard with water trickling down through them and the air goes through and extracts some of the some of the heat is that what you're talking about yep is there kind of a homemade version of that or a something you can buy for a tunnel maybe andy could build us something um i think it's something you can buy commercially any, any uh questions from the crowd here <laughs> You can keep showing. Oh, wait, there's uh... hey, hey, we're on small uh, high tunnels. This is Hans, um, uh, caterpillar, small cat caterpillar tunnels uh, for shoulder season uh, greens. Just curious about ventilation in the in colder or overwintering crops. Uh, you know, the side that you, we're talking about the the sides that um, you know you push up, they're not roll up um and end walls so peak vents so is it that a crucial thing um and this may be for becky or Vern. um you know given the colder climates and you don't necessarily want to vent the sides um or be active on that is uh these end wall peak vents might be a better solution that's a, a question if you've seen that or have any feeling on it yeah, on our farm, we um, we cut a big triangle of plastic out every summer in a panic, and then we tape it back up in the winter. That's a really solid end wall vent. But I think those butterfly vents, I could probably pull up a picture, or Vern could, um, have been pretty awesome. Framing. And Andy could talk to it. Andy and Chris have some great info on ventilation on the UVM Ag Engineering blog. Certainly, that's where the hot hot air is, and it, it's just have a big bubble of hot white air stuck up there if there's no no opening you know above the roll up sides yeah the, the higher the vent the better obviously so anything to let that hot humid air out get a little bit of a ventilation in there there's a picture of a so, butterfly at the top can you see that all right yep yep and um some of these oh, people have them hinge and open out, but the, these, when they're connected in the middle and the butterfly, it's nice. The wind doesn't catch them as strongly as if they're fully exposed. And I just like this one where you can hold it down on the inside with a cable and a, a cleat or something and just get a really secure 
seal. So that's that's one way. Nice big doors that open on the sides here too. I'll get some other pictures. I know Charlie Gray at Four Corners Farm. They have flaps. I think they get the whole peak to uh, open up. See if I can find that. So Vern, while you're looking, um, you asked the question about DIY or DIY. I always get those mixed up. Um, I just put a link in the chat for a product called Hexacomb. Um, it's a it's actually a packing material, but might be relatively easy to put some of this up um, and vent through, like basically spray it down and vent um, air in and get that evaporative cooling for relatively um, little amount of money. So if anyone, Andy, um, is out there and is um, enterprising, you might be able to come up with a pretty um, cheap evaporative cooling system. There's a picture of Charlie Gray with a really large end wall peak vent. So they got one on each side. Also have their traditional vent in the middle there. But yeah, that opens a big area. <laughs> Pretty cool. I haven't seen that one yet. That is impressively big. <laughs> yep. And of course they have it really well hinged and pulley system and cleats to hold it. Also because it opens in, the wind isn't going to catch it, which for something that size is probably rather important. What else um, do you want to see pictures of? <laughs> Scott, Scott asked me to share a picture here. Um, are you ready to talk about that, Scott? Uh, sure. Although I think Ann might have more to say. I, I, I had sent this to her last week, but but share it and then and then see what folks think. Can you guys see that? So this was. Uh, don't remember what type of um squash it was a, a field mixed winter squash um and there was a few plants that looked pretty measly and so i got a closer look and took this picture and i at first i had thought squash vine borer but then uh thinking about it more i think you said there was no frass or anything but that can be really typical of gummy stem blight sort of what you have left is just the cortical, I don't know what the official anatomical term is, but you get like sort of threads of the plant uh, left and everything else is kind of melted away. But um, yeah, that's it was pretty, kind of spongy feeling. Yeah, that's pretty common for gummy stem blight. And we've seen a fair amount of it around this year. Um, be pretty easy to, figure out if we had a sample, but that was my guess. And that it's, yeah, it's a fungus disease. I don't know, anybody else have any opinions? <coughs> I've also seen some fusarium uh, rot, like a stem and crown rot. Uh, but not so much up, up from the soil like this one is. And had he been using the, had he or she been using uh, fungicides at all or? That's a great question. I, I doubt it. Um, just, yeah, this was a field that's kind of off by itself and um, had kind of gotten away from them. And so my guess is they hadn't done any applications. Yeah. Um, we were on a call this morning and maybe Scott, you remember better or Becky, um, but uh, George Hamilton, who really tracks squash vine borers in New Hampshire was saying, those numbers are uh, definitely dropping off, but there are still some egg laying adults out there. And so if you start seeing, and these are more likely to go into fruit, I think, cause fruit damage. So that's something to be watching for. Is that basically what he said, Scott and Becky? That sounds right to me. That sounds that sound like 
close enough. <laughs> yeah, so just something to watch for. And we've had a guy um, uh, trapping for us in West Rutland all summer, and he had one adult last last week, but that's all he's seen of it. So it's kind of a hit or miss pass, but boy, when it's on your farm, it really is devastating. And it got both of my zucchini plants last week. But that's always the first thing to check. If you start seeing wilting in your cucurbits, always look down at the soil line, see if you see that frass, big holes. It'll just be a, a soft mess down there. And then you'll usually find that big border that looks, you know, they're big enough to put on a shish kebab and probably eat, but I don't want to try it. But I think in that case, you'd want to just get it you know, not let that borer complete its life cycle, get it out of the field, till it under. Yeah, and well, a friend of mine, I'll go ahead, Drew. Keep keep going going on on on. Subject, you keep going. Linda? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, in a friend of mine field, um, I, I gave her the plants, um, about a third of the plants are wilting. Uh, they have been wilting and wilting. I didn't check. I, I checked one. I didn't see any frass. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the field what had a lot of sheep poop in it and comfrey and was tilled in. And the first time they used it for squash. And it's on uh, black plastic. The squash is on black plastic. Is there anything that I would look for in a new field that's has sheep poop and, and come free that type of field that would explain why it's wilting or should I just look for for something else I didn't see any frass under it yeah if it's on black plastic my first thought is just an ear and drip I would just make sure I dig up a few of those plants and look at the root systems make sure there's not root rot involved okay okay burner somebody else might have another suggestion but I would definitely Look at the roots. Okay. Thank you. I agree. And also we did see, at least in cabbage this year, two extreme events. I think we mentioned this on some call that you had, but um, stem, was it wire stem, rhizoctonia, where lots of the field just went down and the stems were shriveled just above the soil line. Mm. Um, not so much a squash problem, but I was wondering if anyone else has been seeing that that problem or if it was just isolated events. Anyway, I, I want to talk about of that, but I'm sorry. I said I had a couple samples of that throughout the season, and I think it must have just been the combination of like wet and warm or I'm not sure what or wet and cool early on I who knows anyway I thought we'd talk about something happy not just pests um Lisa McDougal sent me this nice shot earlier in the season of her grassy strips in strawberry with her uh specialized mower there that she uses she's really the queen of these grass walkways has them all over her farm it's slightly sloping, so it's fairly erodible. It's great to have this living color cover, but and color. Uh, she's doing a great job managing it, and you could get a picture of what it looks like this time of year too. But I'm working on the newsletter, and Becky just put a little article in about fall cover cropping. I guess it's a little bit of a challenge when it's this dry, or people. Have people sown fall covers yet? And how are they establishing Had enough rainstorms in most places? You'd hope it be taking. What what are you seeing, Becky? Are things coming up? Um yeah, some. I mean I think with the moisture there's better opportunities now, but I haven't seen a ton of cover cropping this year in general. I think it's been a pretty overwhelming year and that has fallen to the back burner 
Uh, we um we sewed a bunch of plots for trial up at border view a couple of weeks ago we we just got super lucky and timed it right before that hurricane came through and i just took a look at them on monday and they look beautiful um and then we have some plots at the whore farm that we're we're sewing today and unfortunately we're having to set up overhead um irrigation because we're not cons convinced that we're going to get enough moisture um, to successfully um, germinate. So Mother Nature has not been on our side this year. And I know yes. even on my farm, some stuff we seeded just hung out for, it was kind of amazing. It hung out for like three weeks and then it germinated once we got a little bit of rain. So, you know, I think it's just kind of been hit or miss. Yeah, hello, um, this is Linda again. I'd like to talk about flea beetles, <laughs> back to unhappy pests. Um, I've had a horrible time with flea beetles this year. I usually do, my farm gets a lot of flea beetles and I usually am able to grow greens through the summer with covers. This year has been horrible, a um, month and a half, two months, I haven't had any mustard greens at all. I've tried everything. I've tried direct seeding. I've tried transplanting, different kinds of covers. I bought that new Protect Net from um, Johnny's. Uh, even under that, we may nothing. They seem to have um, abated now. Uh, I have some mustard greens out in the field that are growing without cover, and uh, I put some Chinese cabbage, transplanted some Chinese cabbage out. They've been out for a week, and they haven't been completely eaten. I mean, they would have been completely eaten. It seems like they're abating now. So is there anything else I haven't tried for flea beetles, or is there anything else I can do? I've talked to other growers, and some farms have it, some farms don't. I haven't been able to do kale, any kind of any kind of green like that. The only thing that'll survive is chard and it's been struggling with the hot weather. So any advice on flea beetles? Well, I'll just say, I don't know if it's any consolation, Linda, you definitely are not the only one. I was just talking to Andy Jones yesterday and we were both remarking that there's there doesn't seem to be a lull this year you know normally with flea yeah. beetles you get them early in the spring and then there's that summer lull and then you get a pulse again at the end of the season and and that hasn't i haven't noticed a, a drop off um and so um i've heard that they'll chew if you have the row cover leaning right on, over you know floating they can chew through the row cover um but i haven't heard that they get through the protect net i'm wondering if you know they 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 have a larval stage in the soil and so if you've got an area that was you know in brassicas last year um you know make sure you rotate out and then if you get that protect net on early enough um they you shouldn't again shouldn't um have mm -hmm. flea beetles underneath um but that would be I mean, it's yeah. a more expensive, but but certainly a um, should be an effective uh, approach. Well, the protect net is a little. I do four foot beds with cover, and they'll crawl right. I mean, even if it wasn't over from. A, from greens before, there are gaps in the protect net. I've got to redo my rows because the protect net isn't wide enough and it shrinks quite a bit in the heat. Yeah. And that must be where they're getting in. I bet, yeah, you gotta have a good, um, um, you know, for lack of a better word, seal um, so that they, cause they will, if there are any holes or gaps, they will get in then. Mm, okay. Linda, I don't know if you're considering doing any spraying, but if it's, you know, that serious, it might be something you consider. Um, and there's been some research on organic materials and their efficacy. And I'm just sharing the slide mm -hmm. here. This is off the UMass um, site where they've had a crucifer pest control project for a while. And so this was, um, I think, sprays every every 10 days starting in July. This study might have been on Long Island, I don't remember. But anyway, you can just see Entrust is pretty effective. That's the damage on mm -hmm. both uh, 
let's see if I can make this go down here. Um, cabbage on the top, pak choy. Um, but I think since they are so mobile, if you're going to spray, you probably have to do like they did in this study and keep after them. So just another option to consider. Interest, you said. Yeah. Interest? No. Yes. Okay. I mean, they're getting some control with Pyganic okay. there, too. I mean, it's interesting that the surround, at least in the top one, <laughs> seemed to encourage them. It's worse than the mm -hmm. control all the way to the right. I don't know what's going on there um, on the cabbage. And then um, surround didn't do much down below. Um, you know, soap did. Soap gave some control, MPed um, as well. So there are some options. Won't be perfect control, but you might be able to reduce the amount of damage. Yeah, the problem I've had this year with spraying, I've tried soap. I was trying to do soap and like EM, EM, EM1 and uh, a garlic spray and uh, and just giving them fish to help them out in the beginning stages, fish emulsion. The problem is uh, the dry weather, not being able to spray because it's it, when it's hot and dry, you're not supposed to spray. You can spray in the evening or in the morning, and then the timing was really hard this year with the dry weather. <laughs> so it's just like if they're stressed, heat stressed, you're not supposed to spray, right? Or can you push that a little bit? Well, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Oh, I'm talking away. I'm not so sure about that. The fish, I'd definitely be careful because it's pretty high in salts. I'm not a big fan of spraying that. Mm -hmm. um, and, but um, the other materials, and soap certainly, you could get phytotoxicity in the heat. But uh, spinosad and put on um, early in the morning before it's too hot. I mean, it's going to photodegrade to some extent. So evening, it'll last longer, but the flea beetles are more active in the day. But I don't think the heat and a foliar spray of spinosad would be an issue. I don't know. Anybody else think it's a concern? Yeah, so if that's they're going to be active when it's hot and dry. It makes sense to be trying to control them then. Yeah, we sprayed Pyganic and it was, I did the spraying and I was sweating a lot. So I know it was a hot day. I don't know how hot, but, but yeah, they're so active. You want to get that on um, when they're most likely to, uh, to come into contact and feed on it. So. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Comments? I have a question. Uh, this is Brian Morgan. I'm in Charlotte. I, Anne, I sent you an email this past weekend and thank you for your response. But we're seeing mold inside our broccoli heads. So the leaves are mm -hmm. huge. The plants look nice. Um, the heads, it's still heading up, but there's mold. Um, inside of the head, and I'm not sure if anyone else is seeing that or if that'd be a helpful thing to broach. I do have pictures too, Becky, if um, if it'd be helpful to share. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, make you a presenter, Brian. Hang on. And Brian, you didn't send me a sample, right? That's right. I, uh, I have a picture, and you'll be able to see it now, but no, I didn't send you anything. Yeah. yeah so this can be, I've seen this in other films, and fields and it can be devastating and it's my guess and what I've seen and I asked the Great Lakes Veg Group too about this um that, yeah the plants seem fine otherwise but then they get inundated with alternaria but I just wonder if the alternaria is more secondary and it's from heat damage or something like that first, and they're coming in secondary. But because it seemed way too devastating, when I've seen it, it seems way too devastating, and especially in dry years. I mean, I could see it maybe if it had been rainy all summer, but it's been so hot and dry. But and, and is that the same know. thing that? 
that we sent you from from border yeah View? yeah exact same thing it was filled with alternaria and you know i have a hard time i should probably send it off to somebody else but trying to figure out which alternaria for one has a tail x number of millicenters or whatever and the other one's too longer so and that's how you tell apart the opportunistic one from the pathogenic one but um that was my thought those so, are so because, born, correct and that the alternate areas spark is well, the saprophyte the saprophyte is everywhere yeah one thing I'm just wondering, when it's hot and dry and dusty and there's soil blowing on everything, then it's like pre-inoculated for any kind of injury, a tarnished plant bug or even, right. the, even I, the blowing grains could cause injury. Right. But I think key is there's been some other injury first. It's not just this opportunistic pathogen or, yeah. Because if it was the uh, pathogenic one, that's, you know, that comes in, it can come in on seed, but it wouldn't, I just don't think it would wipe out fields like this in hot, dry summers. But Brian, if you want to send me a sample or bring a sample to my house, I live in Williston, I'm happy to look at it and make sure that it is the alternate area, but um, yeah, that's I my guess, but that's, it's only a guess, really. Okay. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Um, that would be really helpful. Any other okay. recommendations for near-term things we could do? I don't oh, know, Brian. Uh, um, sorry, go. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I was just thinking, I missed a, a teeny bit of that, but if, if you're seeing it on all the heads, um maybe cut everything off and hope for some nice side shoots if you get the the main heads young um you might get a nice second round of side shoots okay cool Bye. thank you yeah that you know it would be interesting to know too because conceivably all those side shoots would are going to be produced when it's we've got cooler temperatures so that would be kind of a interesting experiment. Probably want to wipe your knife with a rag soaked with oxidate or weak bleach or something instead of going from plant to plant and potentially spreading it. Well, that was a good question. Any others? Um, and just quickly, Alex was asking for the source of where you found the climate data for these being the last four summers, so for or whatever the hottest summer. Um, so if you have a source for that, would you be able to post it in the chat? Or? Uh, yeah, I think it was my husband. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I can look for a real source. <laughs> I figured. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, the climate scientist. <laughs> yes. Come on, you're at home, right? Get him on the phone. Yeah. Hey, Dennis. <laughs> and uh, where did you see that coin? So, Linda asks a very big and interesting question, saying she can't keep up with all the emails. Give a brief summary. Um, of grants now available for small vegetable growers. And hey, Dennis just said he saw this on WCAX. So there's your source. Oh. For the climate thing. <laughs> okay. So Linda, there is just a call released a state of Vermont, you know, COVID relief kind of bill. I think there were three different buckets. The first one was all dairy, and then this latest call is um, for non-dairy farms. Um, I will try and find that info and email you. I think it just came out last week. 
and I think it was adjusted. Originally, it was going to be losses between you know March and the end of May or something, and I believe that was successfully changed to just be increased costs because the case was made that that's you know in that period is when a lot of produce farms have a lot of revenue, so it's hard to show a loss if you just look at that and um, not the entire year. And these extra costs, even if you made money, could reduce your profit. So I think, I didn't read it carefully, but I think that's where it's at. Is anyone more familiar with it? I see Zach Smith is on the call from the um, financial farm financial management wing of extension. I think he left, actually. Oh, left. Too Sorry. bad. So. So those guys up there in the Berlin office are keeping appraised of these things. But I'll find that email and forward it to you, Linda. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I read it briefly and they listed crops, but because I was just confused. They grow, I grow a lot of different things and it's, you know, it's just doing so I think you're, just, you're mixing that up with there's a federal so there was the farmers so oh, it had a funny acronym um the specialty crop one not the specialty crop there was a usda um i think farm service agency could be reimbursed for losses or losses in storage and then they keep li listing the names of the crops and adding crops and taking crops off yeah 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 um, so that the problem that one's a little challenging. One thing is they have a standard price, which is pretty low because it's just a national program, not specifically aimed for smaller farms. So I don't think that's going to be as, will we'll probably not get you as much potential money as this other one, which was really designed in Vermont for Vermont farms. And, you know, expenses, not just crop losses is my understanding. So I'll find that it's from the working, I think the Working Lands Fund is administering it within the Agency of Ag. Uh, so I'll, I'll look and find that one. But you could always call the Farm Service Agency folks and try and get them to run you through it. I think Julie Jakes down in the Brattleboro office is pretty good. She should be able to help you. Um, for for grants? For that program, that federal yeah. one. But the state yeah. one is where I think I would spend more time trying to figure out how to apply because more likely to benefit you. Any other final questions or thoughts in the last few minutes we have? Well, next week, Margaret Skinner and a postdoc working in her lab will be presenting about saffron production. And that team is super knowledgeable about this crop and has gotten quite a number of growers producing it as a supplement to all of their other crops. So it should be an interesting seminar. Okay. Uh, Vern, um, is this the first time you've had this kind of a chat? Or if yep. you had these before? It's this is the first chat. open one. What do you think? Pictures uh, and things like that. Breaking up a little. I don't know if that's just me. I didn't know what it was going to be like, and I can sort of copy. I couldn't quite hear you, Linda. It sounds like Linda. I can write it down too. Awesome. I can certainly. I, yeah, I, it's awesome, and I do. Oh, sounds Sorry. like just. Oh, you're coming in and out. Give you one last <laughs> chance. Try again. <laughs> okay. Um, this is awesome. I didn't realize what it was going to be like. I can certainly take pictures and things like that beforehand. And uh, yeah, please let us know if you're going to do another one. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we will, uh, given that feedback. And that's a great suggestion. If we ask people to round up their photos, it would certainly make this even more interesting. Yeah, or great. send them to Thanks. us in advance, too, if that's easier. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. Really appreciate it. And we'll Great, thank you. hopefully see you online you. down the road. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.